call to worship is Psalm 149, verses 1 and 2. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let's bow before our God and ask his blessing on the service in silent prayer. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing number 407. 407. Stands a one, O praise ye the Lord, and sing a new song. Amid all his saints, his praises prolong. The praise of their maker, his people shall sing. And children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let's sing all four of 407. We now confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed, confessing with one another as well as God's church around the world, saying, I believe in God the Father.
We now sing number 125. 125 is entitled, The Church, the Bride of Christ. So we see here Christ's love for His church, and that is to be reflected in our marriages as we will hear tonight. Let's sing the first four stanzas, the first four of 125. now go before our Heavenly Father together in congregational prayer. O gracious Father in Heaven, we stand in awe of Thy greatness today and come before Thee to praise and to thank Thee. We bow our heads in Thy presence, for Thou art so awesome and mighty. Thou art the eternal God who has no beginning and no end. Before the earth was, Thou wast in existence. Thou didst create the heavens and the earth, that huge sun and the the seas and the land and the animals and all their intricate designs. And Thou didst make man too. Thou art such a great God and we are so small. We are just a few of several billion people on this planet. One of several planets. Small creatures of the dust. And not only that, but sinful. We sin against Thee. Thou hast given to us Thy law, which we heard read this morning. And we know that we are to worship Thee and worship Thee alone. We are not to be proud. Thou, as the almighty, holy God, dost hate that sin of pride. But so easily we we commit that sin, so easily we look down on others and think that we are better for this and for that reason. We easily talk about others and, and their faults. And easily think of how others should do this or do that and and not how we ourselves should be serving others. Giving our time actually to help. But we're always thinking of the, or can often be thinking of the thoughts or the faults of others. Lord, we deserve punishment. And Thou art a God who is just. Thou art a God who must, that must punish sin. We pray that Thou wilt forgive us in the blood of Jesus. Thou didst punish 
Jesus instead of thy people for all their sins and all their pride and forgive us, Lord, in his blood. Make us to know that even now in our hearts. To know that forgiveness personally, that we might go forward living in thankfulness to thee for that salvation from sin that we know. How amazing it is that thou hast chosen us to have salvation. We thank thee. And how wonderful it is that thou didst love us so much that thou didst send thy son to suffer punishment in our place. Only he could bear thy wrath to the end for all of our sins and pay for every one of them. And he did that. We thank thee. And how, how astounding it is that in time and history thou didst control all things so that we were brought into existence and brought to conscious faith through the preaching and are now even being sanctified and built up in our faith. Lord, we pray that Thou wilt build us up in our faith and build us up in holiness through the Word tonight. As we hear about marriage, may that Word be applied to us. As we hear about the woman and her calling, may that word be applied to the women here and may the, the husbands encourage their, their wives in this way too, to walk in the ways of the Lord. May we not tonight just receive the word as good information. We know that can easily happen. But may we truly see how this applies to our life. May we go forward and, and follow that word in our daily activities in the home. May we see thy work of salvation and how good thou art to us and, and each day be determined and, and seek to give thee the glory in our life. Lord, bless us through the word that's preached tonight. Strengthen thy servant to bring that word clearly to thy glory and praise. And we pray for the church, thy church around the world tonight. We pray for, for those who are being persecuted for thy namesake. There are many who are persecuted today. May they have their eyes on Jesus Christ and live with the hope of the resurrection. We pray that thou wilt be with those who are true missionaries of, the, of thy word around the world. May they be strengthened to spread the gospel today and this week. We pray for our missionaries in this connection too. We think of Reverend Smith and Reverend Klein. Bless them in their work of spreading the truth. May they be used powerfully by thee in the gathering of thy people. Bless especially the work of the seminary and the student that is there. May he be prepared to preach the gospel in that land and to spread the gospel too. We pray for our contacts in different places. We think of Reverend Titus in Myanmar and Reverend Singh, the missionary of, of the church in Singapore, who Reverend Singh labors in India. We pray that thou wilt bless him in his labors too. Lord, we, we long for the gospel to be spread to the four corners of the earth that all thy people that thou hast chosen may be brought to conscious faith and more and more may praise thee, the God of our salvation. And what a day that will be when all thy church is gathered and we are brought into the new heavens and new earth as one with thy people from all around the world, from all history, praising thee perfectly together. What a day that will be. May it come quickly. And Lord, give us opportunity even here to speak the truth to others at our work or at college or at school, wherever we are. May we be looking for opportunities to speak of Thee and our salvation in Christ. And use us, Lord, as tools and instruments in Thy hand in the spread of the truth. We pray for our denomination's ministers too. May they uphold the truth in the preaching. We think especially of our own pastor, Reverend Brummel. Give him what he stands in need of in his work from week to week. That he may bring us the, the gospel and may be led in the green pastures. And we pray too for our denomination today at a difficult day again where we hear the announcement of 
regarding Reverend Klein and his and his resignation from the ministry. And we pray that thou will be with him and with his family spiritually. Lord, provide for them what they stand in need of. And we pray that thou will, even if it is thy will, bring them back to us. And we pray for ministers that thou will provide. There's a, a great need, as thou dost know. We pray that thou wilt give to us, raise up even men from here to go to seminary to learn to preach the gospel and to lead thy people in the truth. Lord, bless our seminary too and may they teach the students diligently again this week that these men might be prepared to go forward and, and be faithful under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are thankful tonight for the opportunity to worship in freedom. We pray that Thou will be with our government leaders, that Thou wilt bring them to repentance if they do not know Thee. Bring them to, to know Thee according to Thy will and use us even in the spread of the gospel to them if it is Thy will. And as we have opportunity to worship here tonight, may we truly worship Thee from our heart. May we magnify Thee from within and love for Thee. In every element of worship, may we be focused upon Thy greatness and glory. We pray all these things to Thee now, confessing that Thou art the God who is able to do for us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we trust that Thou wilt provide all our needs for Jesus' sake. The one who went to the cross for us and earned for us eternal salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The offering tonight is for the building fund. Let us worship God with our gifts. Let's sing number 238. 238. Stanza 3. When the Lord shall count the nations, sons and daughters, He shall see. Born to endless life in Zion, and their joyful song shall be. Blessed Zion, blessed Zion.
All our fountains are in Thee. Let's sing all three stanzas of 238. The scripture reading is Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 25. I'm doing a series in Edgerton now in Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11. This is a recent sermon that I preached there on the creation of the woman. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so far do we read the holy and inspired word of God. The text is verses 21 through 23. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis chapter 2 tells us the truth about the woman, her position in marriage, and her true beauty. Now the world has their own views about the woman and her position in marriage. Today, and this is not just confined to the Muslims, today some treat their wife as their slave. Others, and this is many others, especially in this country, think that the woman should be the co-head in the marriage and they laugh at the idea of submission, saying that's old-fashioned. And in our country, many will not even define what a woman is today and, and say that a man can, can change into a woman. So very obviously, there's lots of confusion today about what a woman is and about her place in the marriage and about her true beauty. Genesis chapter 2 gives us the truth about those things because Genesis 2 is the Word of God. So it's the truth. Jesus himself even quoted Genesis chapter 2 a couple of times in Mark chapter 10, treating this chapter as the Word of God. This is the truth. This tells us the truth about the woman, what her position is in the marriage, and what her true beauty is. So we, we turn to God's Word tonight. And Genesis 2 indicates that God created the woman and instituted marriage right after Adam named the animals. According to Genesis 2, verses 18 through 20, God caused the animals to pass in front of Adam. And the purpose was so Adam would see his need for a companion. Verse 20 of Genesis 2 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. So Adam saw that each animal had another animal like it. But there was not another creature like him. He needed someone to, to fellowship with him. And, and help him perform the callings that God gave to him. He became conscious of that need as those animals passed before him and he named them. And God had a purpose in that. God was making Adam conscious of his need for a, a companion so that Adam would see how good God was when God provided that need. Tonight we're going to learn of, of God providing for Adam in creating the woman. After Adam saw his need, God did just that. He created the woman. And we look at tonight God's unique creation of the woman, her honorable position in, in marriage, and at what her true beauty is. May God work powerfully through the Word so that we see the truth tonight about the woman and see the truth tonight about marriage. And may we follow Go forward following his design for marriage to his glory. Let's consider the text under the theme, God's creation of the woman. God's creation of the woman. First, her unique creation. Second, her good position. And third, her remarkable beauty. First, her unique creation. The text shows that God's creation of the woman was a significant creation. Verse 22 says that God made the woman, indicating that he carefully crafted her. We read, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. That word made in the original language is build. Build And that word in Scripture is often used for architecture, referring to the, the careful design and, and 
and careful construction of a building. Well, God uses that word to describe his making of the woman. He built her. The, the, the clear idea is that he did not make her without really a, a much of a thought, just quickly and didn't really care. No, the word build indicates that he carefully designed her, carefully crafted her. God was hands-on in his creation of Eve, the first woman. It was important. Also, the text shows that this creation was significant when it, it speaks of God talking within himself before he made the woman. Genesis 2, verse 18, we read, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Know that he also spoke within himself before he made the man. So Genesis 1, verse 26, where we read of God's creation of the man. Genesis 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. All that shows that God devoted the same attention to the woman that he did to the creation of the man. Some, that's important because some men view women as less valuable and they, they treat them as less valuable. They act like what, what the woman says about things doesn't really matter. They don't, they don't know anything anyway. They're foolish. Or they, or they treat them as objects instead of people. But Genesis 2 and the description of the woman's creation shows the equality of men and women in the sight of God. They certainly have different roles. God shows that. Different roles, but they are both valuable in the eyes of God. What we learn from that is, is really based on this creation account. God, God sees the woman as valuable, as important, and so must we. Regarding God's creation of the woman... We now focus on how God built her. So it was, it was a significant creation, that's clear. But now how exactly did he build her? First, verse 21 indicates that God caused Adam to sleep. And the Lord God, it says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. Now, God did not induce sleep upon Adam so that Adam could bear the pain of a major operation. That wasn't the point. God caused Adam to sleep to show that man can have no part in the work of creation. Adam could not participate at all in the work of creation. The creation of the woman had to be outside of Adam's experience so that it was very clear to Adam and it's very clear to us today that creation is all the work of the Almighty God. He is the Creator. He alone. So God caused Adam to sleep. And He used one of Adam's ribs to then make the woman. Verse 21b says He took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So God took one of the ribs of Adam. That word rib in the Hebrew can also mean side. And our ribs are on our side. God took one of those ribs and out of that rib made he the woman. That's unique. That's unique. Man was not made that way. The man was not made like this and neither was meant any animal. God's creation of the woman was unique from the rib of a man. That's important. The details of Scripture are important and, and the truth that God made the woman from the rib of a man teaches us a few important things. 
First, that the woman was made from the rib of Adam shows us what the man or the, the husband and his wife's relationship is to be like. It shows that the wife, for instance, the wife is to be a support to her husband. She was made from the rib of the man. The rib is a bone of support. It supports the shoulder bones. The rib cage does. Well, that shows that the wife was to be a support to her husband. Also, that the woman was made from the rib of man shows that she was to live beside him, close to his heart. The woman was not made from the man's head, showing that she was to be his head and be in charge of him. She was also not made from his hands, showing that she was to be his hands or his slave in life. No, she was made from his side, from the bones closest, closest to his heart, showing that she w- would walk beside him and be loved by him. That was God's design for their relationship, the husband and the wife. Second, the fact that God created the woman from the rib of Adam shows that the man and the woman have the same nature. Genesis 2, verse 7 indicates that man has a unique nature, which has a physical side and a spiritual side. He was made from the dust of the ground, something that you can touch. So man has a physical side to his nature. You can touch him. Man also, according to Genesis 2, verse 7, had breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, showing that he has a unique spiritual side to his nature. He was even made in God's image, according to Genesis 1, verse 26, meaning that he was made in true knowledge, to have true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Now, when God made the woman... He did not start from scratch. He did not make an entirely new creature. Genesis Genesis 2, verses 22 and 23 teach that the woman was made from the man, indicating that she has the same nature. She was made from the same stuff. So she has a physical side to her nature. She also has a spiritual side to her nature. She has the image of... She was made in the image of God. So she had true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Third, God's creation of the woman from the rib of Adam shows that the, there is a difference. There is a difference between the woman and the man. God built a female from the man. She had the same human nature. She certainly was a human, but she was different than man. That's why when God brought the woman to Adam, Adam said, she shall be called woman. She had a human nature. She certainly was a a human person, but she had a womanly side to her nature. A feminine side there was a difference between her and the man. And so verses 22 and 23 show really that God created gender at the beginning, creating a man and a woman. It's important to recognize in the world which we live in today. We know what the world says about genders today. So that last week when I searched on Google, how many genders are there? One of the first articles that came up was an article from MedicineNet.com, which was entitled, What are the other 72 genders? Now, Genesis 1 and 2, which is the truth, teaches that God made the man and God made the woman. They're both human, but they express that nature differently God created the woman 
And the text indicates that the woman has a good position in the marriage. A good and significant position in marriage. First, her good position in marriage is that she is a helpmeet. A helpmeet or complement to her husband. Let's see that that's good. That comes out, the truth that she's a helpmeet to her husband comes out in Genesis 2 in a few places. First, Genesis 2 verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. We're familiar with that phrase, but what exactly does it mean? The word help there means helper or supporter or aid. A helper or supporter is one who enables you to accomplish a task. That helper or supporter brings resources or strength to a, a, a job that helps you get it done. That's a help, a supporter. Now, the text speaks of a help meet, and that word meet means fit or suitable. So that God made the woman to be a help meet for the man means that she made, him, made her to be, or he made her to be, a supporter fit for her husband. A supporter suitable for her husband. She complimented him. She completed him. God made her perfectly fit for her husband. What he was not, she was. What she was not, he was. Second, in Genesis 2, we read that the woman is a support for her husband. We get that from the very fact that she was made from the rib of the man. The rib, remember, is that bone of su support. The rib cage is the bones of support. So that shows what the woman is in the marriage, a support to her husband. And Adam also indicate, or God also indicates that Eve was fit for Adam in verse 23. Verse 23, Adam says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That Eve was bone of Adam's bones and flesh of Adam's flesh means that she came from him. She was made from him and thus they were intimately united to each other, intimately connected, intimately fit for one another. Now note, before we move further, that Genesis 2 is not speaking of every woman in the world being a help meet for every man. But it's talking about a woman being a help meet for her man, for her husband. Genesis 2 verse 18 talks about the help meet. That verse is found in the context of verses that talk about marriage. Verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So Genesis 2 verses 18 through 23 are speaking of the woman being a help meet, a fit supporter for her man, her husband. Now how is the woman a help meet for her husband? When considering how a woman is a help meet for a man in marriage, know that this text is talking about a fellow, an image bearer being a help meet to her fellow image bearer. It's talking about the image bearing man and woman. Adam and Eve each bore God's image. Genesis 1 verse 26 indicates that. They each bore God's image, meaning they each had true knowledge of God, righteousness, and holiness. So Eve was a help meet to Adam as a fellow image bearer. That applies to us. 
the believing husband and believing wife here are fellow image bearers. And fellow image bearers because of Christ's work. May that be very clear. Adam sinned in the garden. And as just consequence for Adam's sin, natural man does not bear God's image. Natural man is now in the image of the devil. He suppresses the truth. He lives in the, op- the opposite way of in righteousness and holiness. He, he lives in sin. And that's, that's how we are if we're not delivered. That's how you are. That's how I am if we are not delivered. However, Christ went to the cross. Christ paid for the sins of us believers there at the cross. And because of Christ's work at the cross, He gained the right to live in His people and to work in His people and to renew them in God's image. And that's what He's done in us. That's why we're believers. Christ has given us that true knowledge of God and of Himself. Given us righteousness and holiness. So the believing husband and wife here are fellow image bearers. They both know God and Christ as their Savior and seek to live in righteousness and holiness. The image-bearing wife here is a help meet for her image-bearing husband. How so? Well, the image-bearing wife reflects the virtues of God in a beautifully different way than her husband does complimenting him. To see that, just think for a moment of the virtue love. Both the image-bearing husband and image-bearing wife here reflect that virtue of Christ. Love. But do so in beautifully different ways. The husband, for instance, could have what's characterized as a strong love. Even a tough love sometimes that he's, he pushes his children to, to accomplish a task in love for them. He has a strong, steady hand on them, ca- calling them to keep going, keep going, and helps them. The mother could have, has a love often that's characterized as a tender love. She's, she's especially good at listening to them and replying back with a soft answer. She's especially good with the little children, helping them with all of their different troubles. So you see there that they both reflect that virtue of God, that love, and they complement each other. The wife is a help to her husband in how she shows forth that virtue. The image-bearing woman is also a help meet to her husband in that she helps him grow in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness so that he does his tasks to God's glory. She helps him grow in those three elements of the image of God. Knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Just think of knowledge for a moment. In Edgerton, there are several older men that will often say that their wife has been so important for them in growing in knowledge of the Scriptures, encouraging them to read the Word. And I no doubt doubt that's true here too. Encouraging them to be in the Word and having devotions with them. And the wife is helps her husband grow in righteousness and holiness too because she knows her husband better than anyone else. She knows his weaknesses so well and she can help him. She shows him this is the way. The image-bearing woman is a help to her husband also in that she brings strength and resources to him. Strength and resources to him that help him accomplish the the task God has given him. For instance, she's she's a wealth of knowledge to him in taking care of the children. You sit around the table at devotion time and the the wife can often point the children to Christ in in ways that the husband would never think of. She brings strength and resources to the the caring of the children. She often helps you too see things that you would never see in your devotion time together as you read the Word. Now this text is especially speaking of a wife being a help meet to her husband. But understand that it's also true that an image-bearing woman in general here in the church is a help in the church. 
They do things, the, the woman does things in the church that the man cannot do or certainly cannot do as well. For instance, some, some younger mothers have opportunity to go and visit some of the older ones in the church and they can bring their little children along with them during the day and that brings such encouragement to those older members. But the husband might not have opportunity to do that being one who's, who's working during the day. Woman... Women all are often able to show tender love to those who are hurting and could use encouragement in the church, especially fellow women, so that a, a young mother who needs encouragement, an older mother in the church can, can bring her the word and show her the promises of God that, that God gives to mothers. That older mother knows those promises so well, being a mother. And so she speaks to that fellow mother and encourages her in that way. Women are gifted in speaking to one another and having fellowship. They can talk for a long time after church. What happens sometimes, at least in Edgerton, probably here too, is the, the women are talking for longer than the men and that often encourages the men to have to continue to speak to and continue that time of fellowship. The women are gifted in that, keeping conversation going. And women often can serve by bringing meals to families in need, and they often see that a certain family might be in need at a certain time. They might see that much quicker than a man does. They recognize those things. A woman can certainly be and is a great help supporter in the church. So the woman has a high and, and truly good position in this life. It has to be heard because the world despises what the scriptures say about the wife being a help meet. The world hears that term and they, they do talk about that, what the Bible says. And they'll say that term's degrading to a woman. It's old-fashioned language that makes her sound like she's just some servant. The wife is her own person. She doesn't really need the husband. Well, the truth is that the position of being a helpmeet is a truly good position. It's a position that God created the woman to have. And God called His creation good. See that? God gave this woman, gave the woman that position at the creation, and God called his creation good. So when a woman lives in the marriage to support her husband and, and lives to support the church, she's glorifying God. And, and her life is fulfilled in that way. She has great peace and joy walking in that way because that's God's way. She will be growing in knowledge and love of God in that way as she lives with and near to her image-bearing husband, discussing the Word with him and helping him raise the children in God's fear. That's the way of true happiness and joy. It's not in the way that the world says it is for the woman. The seeking of wealth and high positions in the world is not the way of peace. That does not bring satisfaction. It doesn't. So may the wives here live as, as supports to their husband and, and live in the service of the church. May they do that by Christ's power. Christ empowers His blood-bought children to walk in His way for marriage. He does that. He strengthens His children to do that through the Word. Even the Word that's preached tonight. Now that's first about the woman's good position in the marriage. Second, regarding the woman's good and important position in the marriage, know this, since God made the woman after the man, she is under the man's authority in the marriage. That's the teaching of Scripture. Genesis chapter 2 shows to us that the woman was made after the man. A couple of New Testament passages teach that because that's true, because the woman was made after the man, she is under his authority in the marriage. 
It's 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. I'll read that. I'll find that a moment. I'll give you time as well. We read there, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So we read in verse 12 that the woman may not usurp authority, that is, exercise authority over the man. Why? Well, verse 13 gives the reason. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 teaches the same. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, we read, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That the man is the head in the marriage means that he rules, just as a head rules the body. Verse 8 indicates why. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 8 says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. The woman was made from the man, so the man is the head. What does it mean, though, that the woman is under the man's authority in the marriage? What does that entail? Well, it means that the husband rules and leads in the marriage. He makes the major decisions. He's the one who takes the lead in the, in the family's spiritual life at home. So he's leading in family devotions. He's the one who's making sure the catechism is done and done well. He is the spiritual leader in the house, setting the direction for the home. That God has placed the wife under the husband's authority means that she is to live in submission to her husband. We read that in Scripture in several places. She's to live in submission to Him. But what does that mean? That she is to live in submission to Him means that she willingly places herself under His rule. Willingly places herself under His rule. And it means that she loves Him. She obeys Him. She respects Him. And she obeys Him unless, always, unless He tells her to sin. Even then, she still submits to him in the sense that she still views herself as being under him. And when she says she must disobey, she makes clear, I'm not trying to take your position of headship, but I simply cannot go along with this because it's sin. The woman is under the man's authority, but now the man, he's to love her. He's to rule her in love. That makes sense with that analogy of headship in 1 Corinthians 11. Think of this. If your head, your head is working right, then your head does not decide to do things that harm and hurt your body. Doesn't, your head doesn't decide to do things that destroy the body. A head that's working right rules its body in love. Seeking the good of the body. We'll now apply that to, to the man who's the head in the marriage. He's the head. He's the ruler. He is to rule in love. Seeking the good of his wife. He seeks her good physically. So that when she's tired after a long day of taking care of the kids, he does what he can to help. And he seeks her good spiritually so that he's in the Word with her. Seeking to help her grow in knowledge, righteousness, holiness. And part of ruling her in love is that he respects her too. So that he's not, he doesn't treat her as a doormat and demand silence from her all the time. But instead... When decisions have to be made, he shows very clearly that he values her opinion. He wants to hear from her, and he shows that he's listening. He wants to hear what she thinks. 
And he gives her freedom to use her talents for the good of the home and, and thanks her when she does so. That wife's position in the home under her husband, that's a good position. It's an important position and a good position. And that needs to be heard because that, again, runs contrary to the world's thinking about the wife's position in a marriage. Many in the world today despise the idea of submission. They say that the woman should be the head, or at least the co-head, and, and argue there's no value in, in being the one who submits to someone else, but only in being submitted to. Well, the Bible tells us that the wife is under her husband's authority and teaches that this is a good and important position. Remember, God called His creation good. That includes His ordering of marriage. That's good. It serves to God's glory and to our benefit. To understand that, look at the negative. Think of, if, if it would, think of a marriage where the husband and the wife are co-heads. What would happen? Well, what would happen eventually is there would be fighting. Fighting and arguing. Nobody willing to budge. The husband and wife will be arguing rather than growing together spiritually. And they'll be arguing instead of spent having their focus on their children and their children's spiritual growth. Things will not be in order. But then, think of when the husband and the wife are doing things as God has called us to. When the husband rules in love and the wife lives in submission. When that's happening, God is praised. And things are in order in the home. The husband and wife are helping each other grow spiritually and they're able to focus on their children and rearing them in God's fear. Now we understand very clearly, we must tonight be reminded of it, that the woman will never submit to her husband by her own power. And the man will never rule his wife truly in love by his own strength. Will not happen. By nature, men and women are opposed to God's way. And that's so evident in the world today. Women only see the truth about their place in the marriage and only submit by the power of Jesus Christ. And men only rule their spouse in love by the power of Christ. Remember who He is. Remember who Christ is. He's the one who loved His church all the way to the cross. Perfect love. And He's the one who submitted to God all the way to the cross, following His way, His way of suffering all the way there. And in doing so, He earned all the gifts of salvation for us as people. Well, He now, that Christ, He now works in the wife here to submit to her husband more and more to God's glory. And he now works in the husband to love his wife more and more to the glory of God's name. He works mightily through the preaching of the gospel. Praise be to God for that. Praise him tonight. Now in the last place this evening, understand Eve's remarkable beauty. Adam made a remark about his wife's beauty in verse 23, expressing his love for her and glorifying God and what he said. He was amazed at his wife's beauty. At the end of verse 22, we read that God brought her to the man. It's the end of verse 22. God brought her to the man. And then verse 23 states, And Adam said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam was expressing amazement there at his wife's beauty. And to see that more clearly, I'll read to you how this verse reads in the original language. In the original language of verse 23, Adam says the word this three times. So he sees her and he says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This shall be called woman because this was taken 
out of the man. As soon as Adam was created on the sixth day, he looked around and he saw the beauty of God's creation. So unaffected by the fall yet. So the glorious sunshine, the, the plants and, and trees so green around him. Amazing beauty. But then he saw the woman. He saw his wife. And he said, this, this, this. She, she was the most beautiful thing that he had seen. And he was indicating that she was beautiful by continuing to say, this is, this is what she is. This, this, this. And he was saying in verse 23 that she wonderfully fulfilled his need. She was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She was fit for him. She was his helpmeet that would help him serve the Lord in all of his tasks. She would live in fellowship with him and as they together served God in that garden. So by these words, Adam was expressing love to his wife and praising God. He said these words of verse 23 right in front of his wife because God had just led her to him and he expressed right to her how great she was. How she was the one that was fit for him. She's wonderful. He said that right to her. And by saying that, he was also praising God for God was the one who had made her. So he was glorifying God with his words just as, as God called him to do. That's why Adam was created, to glorify God. And that's what he was doing with these words in verse 23. And what Adam says there in verse 23 has application to the husbands here tonight. See, husbands, that the image-bearing wife that God has given to you is beautiful. And tell her that. Tell her that she's beautiful and just right for you. Understand that God has led your wife to you. God, we read in verse 22, led Eve to Adam. Well, God is the providential ruler of all things today. He has led each of you that have a wife, he has led that wife to you. And, and young people, one day when you get married, that one to whom you get married is the one that God has led to you. Now, God has not just led your wife to you, but has led your wife to you in love. He sees you in Christ. So he controls everything in your life for your good. He's led your spouse to you in love for you as one whom he sees in Christ. Now, see that image-bearing wife that God has given to you. See that she is beautiful. She has been given true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. She is fit for you. Just right for you. She helps you grow in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. She helps you raise your children in the fear of the Lord and helps you perform your tasks each day to the glory of God. Now see her beauty and tell her. Do not leave her to wonder if you appreciate her. May it not be the case that we think, well, I told her that I love her on my wedding day, but... And if things change, then she'll know. I don't need to tell her all the time. No, tell her and tell her again and again that you appreciate her, that you love her, that she is the one who is just right for you, for God has led her to you. Tell her you love her as Adam did to his wife. And say that to the glory of God. Thank God each day for leading your wife to you. Now, not everything is perfect in our marriages because we each still have a sinful nature. We know that. But thank God that He has led your spouse to you. One who is just the right person and helps you perform the tasks that God has given you to His glory. Praise Him and thank Him for that. And, and 
women here praise and thank God for the way that God created the woman and for the salvation that he has given to you in Jesus Christ and your position that he has given to you to glorify him in. Thank and praise God tonight and in your marriages. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, Lord, we are thankful for thy word. We, Lord, stand amazed at thy salvation. We stand amazed that in love for us, thou dost give to what many of us a spouse. Lord, in our marriages here in this church, may we be glorifying thy name. May the husband rule in love and the wife live in submission to thy praise, by thy power. And we pray that all the women that are here may live as supports to the church, to the glory of thee. Lord, strengthen us through the word that we have heard. Forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing Psalter number 360. 360, stanza 2. Stanza 2 we sing, In thy wife thou shalt have gladness, she shall fill thy home with good, happy in her loving service and the joys of motherhood. Let's sing all five stanzas, all five of 360.
Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.